Well, good morning again. My name is Anna, and I'm one of the pastors here, and friends are there to push you outside of your comfort zone. And so here's actually a photo of my friend and I. We went to Costa Rica like a little over a year, and a little over a year ago. And she had spent a lot of time planning this trip. And one thing she really wanted to do was go zip lining. And so that is us zip lining. And I was like, yeah, 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 sure we'll go, thinking that we were going to find something else to do because I really like to keep two feet on the ground. And I'm not really a fan of heights. But I thought, you know what? She took all this time to plan this trip. I kind of helped. I helped hold the table up while she was on the computer. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to say yes. So. It was the night before we were going to go zip lining, and to my surprise, we had already paid for this excursion. And so if you know me, I do not like wasting money, and so we were going to go on this excursion. And so we didn't really talk out loud with words about this trip, about this, the uh, zip lining experience. And so that night, I spent a good chunk of my time in the bathroom. And I was like on my phone, and I was like, can you die zip lining? Is it safe to die? Uh, is it safe to zip line in Costa Rica? And then I was like, how many people have died zip lining? And I was just getting all that information, and it was like probably the most reckless, uh, restless sleep of my life. I was waking up, and there I was falling to my death and dying. Okay. So it's the morning of, and we're like walking up to the excursion, and you gotta like, of course, like walk up like some elevation, and we're like with a group of people, and these people, like I'm saying, they were like all chatting and giggling and laughing, and I'm thinking, hello people, we are going to die. Why are we giggling and laughing? Whatever. And so the one encouraging thing my friend says to me is, do not worry. We are going to have a tutorial about how to zip line before we get up there, or once we get up there. So I said, all right, all right. And so slowly I'm walking up there. We get up there, and the guide like gathers us all around, right? And he goes, okay, well, who wants to go first? Let's go. And that was the tutorial. <laughs> Obviously, I am alive. I've got, and so I did make it. And I would probably go back if she wanted to go again. But to an extent, I feel like this is what Jesus is telling us today. Go out and make disciples of all nations. I don't know about you, but I have so many questions. Who, how, when, where, and why, right? There's no short tutorial that Jesus is giving. He's just saying, go out and do it. And today, I want to process through this with you a little bit. What is God commanding us to do, and how can we do it? I want to take a moment right now to demystify the idea that you must make disciples to go to heaven, because that's untrue. Being saved happens in a moment since we are saved by grace, and grace is a free, unmerited gift from God. And it's, we are saved through faith, by believing in Jesus' life, his death, and resurrection. And that is all that takes to be saved, is sin, repentance, and faith. Then we get to experience this other side, and that's called discipleship. And discipleship will last the rest of our lives. In response to what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for all of us, we want to, through his life, his death, and his resurrection, we are all saved. But the big thing here is that anyone who has truly encountered Jesus Christ, there's no way that they can continue living in their own way. The old you has died, and every day you are on this journey of living a new life, being a disciple. Let's look at those who have encountered Christ in the Bible. In the Bible, there was a man named Saul, and he hated those who associated as Christians. And he actually went out and killed Christians. And then he encounters God, and then he becomes on fire for God in his movement. So much on fire that his name changes from Saul to Paul. Think about the man who is blind, and then Jesus spreads mud on his face, and then he is able to see again, or the lame who can walk and I wonder about each one of you who have encountered Christ. What's your story today? If we go back and we look at the passage for today, now the 11 disciples have encountered Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and he is giving them a commandment that will start this Christ-following movement. But if you look at verse 17, it says, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
Here, Jesus is picking the people that he believes is going to continue his Christ-following movement once he ascends into heaven, and he's picking people who have doubt. I think until we get to the other side of heaven, there is going to be doubt in our lives. Think about the extent of what Christianity is asking us to believe, that the creator of this world has come down to this earth because he loves us so much. He's lived the perfect life on this earth, he dies, and then on the third day, he rises again and walks out of the tomb. I don't know about you, but for me, that's so hard for me to grasp my mind around as a human. And I wonder when we look at the hardships in our lives, it's hard to believe that there really is a God who loves us and who has a true plan for us. Look at those who doubted in the Bible, like Doubting Thomas, who didn't believe that it was Jesus Christ himself who had resurrected. He said, I have to see him from my own eyes. I have to see the wounds in his hands and on his side. I think doubting can lead to more certainty if we continue to search for answers and understandings about things that we doubt. Sharing our doubts with others, if approached right, can lead us to a stronger understanding. God isn't picking the perfect team to continue his church. He is picking human beings like you and me. Jesus Christ qualifies the unqualifies. He then commands them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that is the same commandment that God is giving us all today. We are God's plan. We are his aid team to sharing his love with everybody else. And I think that's a really, really big responsibility. And don't worry if fear has now struck you after hearing this commandment that God has given us. Because we're going to walk through this a little bit now. And so the first question I would have is, what is a disciple? A disciple is someone who follows Jesus Christ. And as a disciple, we will spend the rest of our lives trying to shape our lives to be more and more like Jesus in our studies, in our time with God, in our knowledge and how we treat others. It's impossible to be a disciple of someone and not end up like that person. As I look at this passage in Matthew, I believe that Jesus is clearly stating that he has chosen his church. And not the small C church like a building church, the big C church, the body of Christ, to continue his work of creating people who are followers of him. Now the next question I had was, how do we become a follower of God? And that's through encountering Christ for ourselves. And this is not head knowledge that we can have. This has to be heart knowledge. And once that happens, there's no way that we can say the same. So if we break this down a little bit, our job as the body of Christ, the large C, church is to share God's love with others so that they can be transformed by God. And now I'm sure the question is, well, why am I supposed to do this? I know that God commands us to do it, but besides the commandment, why should I do this? Discipleship is a response for what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for each one of us. And so let's say, for example, my mother. She was a really good mom growing up, and she continues to be a good mom today. And as I, I think about it, as she ages, I plan to take care of her no matter what. And I'm not doing this because I feel obligated to do it. I'm not doing this because my mom was like, well, you have to take care of me. And she's not paying me to do that. But I do that out of response of how good she was to me and how much I love her. I desire to do it. People matter to God and people matter to you. I assume that we are all here because someone has shared God with us. I want to spend the rest of our time focusing on how we can go out and make disciples of all nations. Did you know that it takes a minimum of 20 interactions for someone to become a Christ follower? One thing that is so hard for me about youth ministry is that, honestly, you probably are never going to be able to see the fruit of your labor. 
in youth ministry, if you spend a lot of time wondering, are they understanding this concept? Is this just head knowledge or is this heart knowledge? Are they really listening? Am I really making a difference? And why am I here? And the truth of the matter is, is that you might not even know what happens to them once they graduate high school. As I look at my own spiritual walk as a child and then into adulthood, Sunday mornings, it was a battle. Saturday morning, I would get up really early. We'd have a day off of school. I'd be tearing up the town, right? And then Sunday mornings, I would fake sleep in as long as I could. Then I would hear my mom, like, rustling around, and I would be, like, hoping she, f- she forgets that every Sunday, church is on Sunday. All right? So then she'd wake me up, and I'd be like, all right, well, we have to go. So then I would just start to, like, start an argument so we wouldn't have to go, like, as early to church. And so we would, like, argue about, like, what I was wearing or something like that. All right, so finally we get to church, right? That's when I started asking, like, really, really important questions. And so, like, we'd be sitting in the pew, and I would look up at, like, a light, and I would say, Mom, what do you think would happen if the light just fell on a person right now? And then the most important question ever, can we go to lunch after this? And don't even get me started on youth group. It would be like a cry fest. I would try to like just cry my way out of having to go to youth group. And when I would go, I would go for the snacks, okay? This movie, this church had like a little movie theater, which was cool, and then you could just like eat popcorn. And so that was my favorite thing. And so, you know, I don't think anyone who was in my spiritual walk as a child would think that I am standing here today with you all. Here's the true, hard truth of the matter is, is that we cannot argue someone in to the kingdom of God. We cannot force them physically into heaven by making them come to church or forcing them to go to youth group. We can't talk someone into the kingdom of God, and we sure can't pay them. And the truth of this matter is, is no matter how many Bibles you buy a person of different translations, you can't force them to read them. That's impossible. I do believe that there are three things that are required to guide someone in to the kingdom of God. That is time, that is prayer, and that is Jesus Christ. I think everyone here today has a person on their heart that they truly want to encounter Christ. Maybe it's a friend, a family member, a neighbor, or it's a coworker. So I want you to think about that person and we're going to call them one, your one. The one person in your life that you are going to make a commitment to relationally invest in. Your one is a person whom God has laid on your heart to pray for, come alongside, and share life with. This one may not know who Jesus is. So I want you to take a moment to think about who that person is. And if that person doesn't just come to your mind, that is okay. I encourage you to just take a moment to Pray with God and ask him who that person might be. And so as a congregation right now, we're just going to take a couple of minutes to give you some time to pray about who that is. And then for that piece of paper that I gave you before, I encourage you to just write down that name once it comes to So I'm going to give you some time now to do that.
So if you have a person written down, I encourage you that when you come up for communion, you can drop that in the basket up front. And I did realize that I didn't accommodate for the side, and I apologize for that. And so I'll bring the basket out um, as you exit, and so you can also place the name out on the side as well. And if God hasn't placed someone on your heart today, that's, that's okay, too. It took me a while to figure out who my one is going to be. But I encourage you to just keep praying about it. And then when, it, when, a name, when God brings a name to your heart, you can just um, place it in the basket as well. And we are going to have this prayer class starting next, this, not next Monday, this Monday, tomorrow, at 6.30 p.m. It's going to go on for six weeks. And I encourage you to just come and check it out. Um, if you don't need to RSVP, you can just come. And if it's not your thing, no need to come back. But during those next six weeks, we are committed to just praying for your one and also you as their partner. God is calling us to make disciples of all nations. And we know that we cannot do it without the Lord who promises us in his word. Surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so as we head into the next six weeks, I pray that you have an opportunity to build a deeper connection with your one. May God create a situation or a conversation or give you the nudge you need so God's love can flow from you to your one. I pray God gives you an opportunity to invite them to an event, and maybe that's just having coffee with them. Maybe it's inviting them to an event here at a church. Like if you're a lady, you can come to our Stress Feast Bring event on April 26th. Maybe you can invite them to your small group, or you can even invite them on Sunday for a worship service. We cannot force anyone into God's kingdom, but we have the ability to invite them. Through prayer, time, and Jesus Christ, Anything is possible. And so I just want to end by sharing this story that I heard. It's a true account from a pastor. A pastor, after a baptism service, he bumps into a woman on the stairwell, and she's crying. And he thinks that's kind of odd, especially because this was a baptism service. This should be a joyous time. And so he asks the lady, are you okay? And she says, no, I'm struggling. She said, my mom was baptized today, and I prayed for her for almost 20 years. The reason I was crying is because I came this close to giving up on her. At the five-year mark, I said, who needs this? God isn't listening. At the 10-year mark, I said, why am I wasting my breath? And at the 15-year mark, I said, this is absurd. At the 19-year mark, I said, I'm just a fool, but I just kept trying. I kept praying, even with weak faith. I kept praying. Then she gave her life to Christ, and she was baptized today. I will never doubt the power of prayer again. I know for our Lenten season that we have already been placing names of people who don't know Christ into the basket, and we have heard amazing stories come out of just those six weeks right here from our congregation. Knowing that God is working in our, in our lives, giving us opportunities to share who he is with others in the world, we are so excited to see what the next six weeks will bring. And I hope you remember that God has commanded us to go up to make disciples, and it takes three things. It takes prayer, it takes time, and it takes Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity just to gather, Lord, and hear, um, hear your word, Lord. We just thank you for giving us this very important responsibility to go out and make disciples with you, Lord. And we, we know that we are your plan and we are your A-team, Lord. We just ask that you give us patience. We understand that your time is different than ours, Lord. And we just um, commit to you to continue to just pray with you and have a conversation with you, Lord. And we just thank you um, for always being with us, Lord. And so we just ask that as we head into this relationship with our one, Lord, you're just always with us. Let us know when to speak and when not to. Let us know when to listen. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.